Hello and welcome to the May 2023 questions and answers video here on Meekness Fans Hideout. That's me. I'm Chris Meekness Fan over on Patreon.com. Kind souls who have given me money were able to submit questions in the Discord channel. I have a Discord. If you want to get into it? Patreon.com slash Meekness Fan. Toss a buck. Uh, if you're ever on Twitch, throw a sub in. You'll get in. So that's what's up. Or if you want to ask a question, you can also just leave a comment on this video and I will probably answer it next time. As long as it's a good question, I'm not picky. All right, we got the ramble out of the way. All right, so thank you everyone for wanting to ask questions. First of all, uh, if you have any questions you think would sound good and lead to an interesting answer in a video, or if you just want to hear me say your question, hey, give me money or just comment below and don't give me money either way. I like attention. So a few good questions today, hopefully a shorter one. Um, I'm going to start with AE doubles question titled second question, um, because a lot of people have found this channel recently due to the living deck stream archives. I've been putting up from my Twitch, twitch.tv slash Meganist fan. I'm out here chilling. We're in full on plug mode. We're going ham right now because for some reason, YouTube algorithm folded those videos out to hundreds of people collectively. Um, just videos like straight up that that first living decks one I made from November 2022. The one that was like this hour should convince you not to make a living decks. That was that was a joke. That was a dumb thing. I've had people get angry at me for that title for some reason, but that was something I was just like. I'm just going to hit record and talk about my Pokemon and put it out to my stream archive viewers who in my mind is like a dozen people max. So I, I just put that up and over the months since YouTube has just been like, no, people should have to look at this, I guess. And I've been like, oh, if I'd known people were going to watch it, I would have not made it an hour long and actually made it concise. But that's where we're at. Um, and yeah, for some reason, the Loving Dex videos since then have been pushed out. So it is a topic now that um people a few people are interested in at least like some of you guys have stopped by the twitch even and surprised the hell out of me and have been like hey i was watching the living deck streams now i'm here and i'm like why do you want to watch them i put them up by god but it amazes me that anyone actually sits down and is like i'm gonna watch this i don't think i'm that entertaining but hey we're here so a double second question that i'm answering first was how many years will you keep a living decks going great question um, you know, I think the thing is, once I am at the point where it's complete, right? It's complete for a time. There's always going to be new Pokemon. I think we've all accepted this as a fact of life, right? Every three years, we get a dump of new Pokemon. And now maybe in some of the side game spinoffs, remakes or whatever, we'll get some new forms introduced or a couple new Pokemon, right? Like Legends Arceus introduced stuff like Enamorous. So we'll get some new ones here and there. But once I'm over this initial huge hurdle and have everything, it'll be so much easier going forward, right? Like once you put in that work and that time investment to do this, all you have to do is worry about the new Pokemon coming out afterward. I don't, unless you want to, you know, impose like a new challenge on yourself after that, right? But and honestly, God bless you if you do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, once it's over, like there's um. Oh, how many Pokemon now? A thousand eight? A thousand something? And if you count Walking Wake and Iron Weaves and gender variants and regional variants and like Alchemy alone, having all the forms of Alchemy is like what? <sighs> seven by seven, like. And then like a Gigantamaxable one, maybe in Milsery. Like that's like 50 Pokemon there, I guess, right? Maybe more, maybe less. I, I don't remember how many different variants there are, but that's so many just on their own, right? Once you're past all that, I mean, anything's easy. I mean, my God, after I did Alchemy, I was like, I can do anything. <laughs> Once I did those, I was like, my God, well, of course I can do this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I will keep it going. It really just depends on will I forever be interested in Pokemon. And so far in life, you know, I, I have my dips, my interest wanes now and then, right? Like some generations I'm less invested in. Um, but I, I have been kind of in, more into Pokemon in the last couple years than 
I had been in a long time. Like I played a lot of X and Y. I played like 40 hours of Sun, which surprises me every time I go back to Sun. I'm always like, I played so much Sun, but then I open my save file and I, I think I didn't even crack 40 hours. I'm like, my God. But if I look at how much time I played the games now, I have like 300 hours in Scarlet. I put another 50 in the Violet over the last couple months. Um, Legends Arceus, I have like 80 hours in, right? And like, that's one of my new favorite Pokemon games ever, if not my favorite. Um, I haven't really sat down to think about that, but you know, I'm like more into it than I have been in years. So if that keeps up, I will definitely keep it going. Um, maybe at a point it's like, oh, I put all this time in, it, you know, it becomes like a compulsion. It's like, well, I had to keep it going. You know, I, 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 all that work is for not now, now that there's new Pokemon, I had to go catch them. Right. So we'll see. I, 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 I think Pokemon as, um, gosh, maybe naive, a bright future. I think the games will get better than what we're getting now, you know. Um, as someone who has at least enjoyed the new games, you know, I, I think it looks up from here, really. It, um, so I, I think I will continue to be into Pokemon, and I think I will continue to work on the living decks. And, you know, hey, it'd be kind of cool. Every three years a new Pokemon comes out, I'll just stream it, you know, and that's part of the fun, and it's a long-going quest. I'm looking forward to that future, but... Yeah, until I die, you know, that gets a little morbid, right? Like, then the question is, like, how long will Pokemon go on? You know, will there ever be a point where they're like, oh, God, we made 2,000 Pokemon. We're never making a new Pokemon, and we're just going <laughs> to focus in on what we got here. Right? Like, when, when does this stop? Will I be 73 being like, oh, hey, yeah. Pokemon Radiant Scarlet and Dazzling Violet are out. No, oh, we got to see the new Coridon and Maridon form. Oh, my God. <laughs> when does it end? <laughs> oh, no, I don't like this. Okay, now for our second question, we're going to A-Double's first question. When do you think was the first time you paid attention to who made a game and know their name? This isn't, this is a cop out, easy answer, but it's the one that's true. I, you know, when you start up a video game, you always see a bunch of logos, right? But when I was a kid, that Sonic Adventure Sonic Team intro with that really, um, quite kind of loud, uh, I, I, I don't know audio engineering, but there's like this kind of loud sound effect that fades in real fast and you know, you have that woman's voice going, Sonic Team, and, you know, it's on this. Uh, it, 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 you just have to pay attention to it, right? Like, it's one thing for a game logo to pop up, but it's a woman saying Sonic Team. Like, it's just impossible to ignore. So I think right away, <laughs> um, Sonic Team was the one. Um, you know, especially back then, like, I, I don't know how much this worked for them as a company to do this, but it worked on it. It worked for me, because anytime I saw the Sonic Team logo on anything in the game shop after that, it would catch my eye, because I was like, oh, it's Sonic Team. They make Sonic games, right? I explicitly remember seeing um, on the Billy Hatcher box, on the North American copy at least, you know, it either has like a Sonic Team thing, or like from the creator of Sonic the Hedgehog on it or something. There's like a little stamp that lets you know, hey, this game made by people who made Sonic. And uh, I, I think that partially... Um, fueled my the, what I like to do is just kind of follow the things that people I make what let me start the sentence over <laughs> when someone makes something I like I like to then follow things they make after and then things they made before and then just kind of watch the lineage of their ideas right the evolution of concepts and ideas and iterations right I think it's very interesting um it's why um, you know, for example, it's cool going through all the Pokemon games right now because you get to see the things they brought back, the things they iterated on, the things they got left to the side. Um, I'm still in the Sato Satoshi Tajiri days of the franchise, but once we get to Ruby Sapphire, then we enter the Junichi Masuda games, right? It's like, how is his direction different? How are things different under him? What things can we trace along as we go through each generation of Pokemon? Um, and just watching things sprout and develop and get brought back later on after being away for a while. Like I, I like, I like seeing traces of humans in work, right? Um, 
n another example that just comes to mind. Like, there was a time where I would play a video game because Hideki Kamiya had made it. You know, there was a time where I would play a game just because there was a Platinum Games logo on it, right? Like, I, I knew that being from them meant something, <laughs> at least for a long time, and that I could get kind of a similar experience to things I liked from Platinum Games if I got a new one, right? I bought the wonderful 101 at launch because it was a Hideki Kamiya game and it was from Platinum. And I was like, I, I don't know if this looks fun looking at these trailers, but by God, I'm going to see what it's like. And I wound up really liking it. So, you know, I, I think Sonic Adventure put that in me early. And I, I think I eventually would have became that person no matter what anyway. Um, but just having that like unignorable studio splash screen on a game I would start up over and over and over and over. I played so much Sonic Adventure as a kid. It was burned into my brain that Sonic Team was a team and they made Sonic, <laughs> right? Um, you know, especially seeing Sonic Adventure 2 for the first time at Circuit City. Um, it was an electronics chain here in the States. And he's like, whoa, sequels exist and Sonic Team, the connective tissue. Oh my God, the Sonic Team. And then, you know, I look at the names in the credits, like June Sanoe and Johnny Gioelli and Tomoe Otani, right? Like composers, especially, I would track for the music, you know? A lot easier to do than like, oh man, the programmer's back. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot easier to quantify like, oh, the composer's back, right? For the music. But yeah, uh, Sonic Adventure. That, um, yeah, typical answer for me, but that is the long and short of it, you know? And... Yeah, I, I don't think I'll ever not be that person. Like I, 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 I just like seeing, um, I just like seeing people in their work. I guess, right? Not to open up a can of worms here, but it's why I find all this AI stuff amusing at best, but uninteresting on the whole. Because I like. <laughs> It's weird that this is a statement you have to make now. I like things that are made by people. I like, I, I just like it, you know? Like, no matter how incredible and amazing something is, I like the fact that it does um, spring from the same kind of well we all have access to in some way, right? The general human experience. It sounds really pretentious, but you know, it's like, no matter how amazing something is, it's like, wow, someone kind of like me made that. Whereas with AI, it's completely disconnected. Like, there's no thought. There's no um, direction, right? It doesn't come from an organic place. And I just don't find interesting anything about that. Like recently thinking about Sonic and I'm just straight up rambling now. We're here. Um, it, it was one of those um, Twitter accounts ran by like a good guy, right? Totally nice guy running it. But they were like, oh, I, here's um, here's the Sonic the Hedgehog game covers. But like, here's the rest of it. We used AI to make the rest of the scene, you know, and it's like the Sonic CD box art, but there's more or it's the Sonic 3D Blast box art. But oh, here's the here's the area around it. And they weren't framing it like it was, you know, it, it was completely upfront. Like, hey, this is AI generated. But I was just looking at it and I was like, man, I feel nothing looking at this. This does nothing for me. Like, it's not even cool. I'm just like, ah, man. Eh. So, you know. It's a it's a thing, and I'm probably going to be even more attentive to the people who make things going forward as um, this becomes inescapable going forward. Um, but yeah, you know, <laughs> how does that answer your question? What am I at? Seven minutes per answer? Let's go. Maybe this won't be a shorter one. OK, Goldstorm07. First question I'd have asked in a while. What are some recent, since like November 2022 or so, games that you got that were harder to find information about, and or otherwise, and I got them without really looking at feedback or solely based on their premise looking appealing? And Goldstorm apologizes for the question, maybe being awkwardly phrased, which is fine. I, I think basically what this is asking is like, what's a game recently that I kind of went into blind, right? Where I didn't really know anything about it, I didn't look up what people said. I kind of just saw a game and I just went, you know what? I'm going to play it. And honestly, I don't know. Even if I think um, further past November 2022, right? The thing is in this space, 
I follow so many people who play games. I listen to gaming podcasts. I, you, you know, I go, <laughs> I go to reset era, like a very enthusiast forum. And, you know, I follow a, a bot that posts all the new threads and all the new news from games, right? Like I, things have generally at least crossed by my radar at least once, you know, most games, like I at least hear about them, right? I remember hearing like the first murmurs of player unknowns battlegrounds back before that would go on to be a huge thing you know so it's tough i can't really think of any um like old storm asked this question a few weeks ago and i kind of just sat on it and thought about it recently um you know what actually there is one i'm looking at it and i probably mentioned it um I feel like I mentioned Risk of Rain 2 recently, but that's one where Kevin the Golden Bolt was kind of like, yo, this game looks cool. I want to play it with people. Let's just fucking get it and play it together. And we did. And I didn't know anything about Risk of Rain 2 going into it. I didn't look anything up about it. I didn't. I knew it was a rogue um, like, rogue light, whatever genre delineation. <laughs> um, I didn't know anything about it. You know, it's a genre I usually don't even like. Um, but we wound up playing it and I had like a weird binge moment with that game where I played like 67 hours of it within the span of like a month or two you know I'd play it with um some of the crub guys you know we're, we're an established brand now I can say we're the crub guys um and sometimes I just play it by myself to unlock like new weapons and loadouts and things um in a genre I didn't really like but that was the one that made it click for me and finally make sense and I was like oh this is why people like it like I finally get it you know before going into that game, I was always like, why would I put so much time and work into unlocking all these tools and um, building weapon arrays and upgrading things just to lose it all and have to do it all over again? Like, it just didn't ever click in my brain. But we gave it a shot and I wound up finally breaking past that mental barrier and being like, oh, no, this is great, actually. And then it opened the door for me to like something like Vampire Survivors later on in the year, which... I had heard good things about throughout the year, here and there, like once in a while, I'd hear someone be like, oh, you know, Vampire Survivors, I, I played it and then a week passed and I blinked twice and I don't know who I am anymore. <laughs> like everyone was just talking about how addictive it was. And I was like, ah, and then I played it and had a very similar experience. Um, so, you know, that was one also where I didn't really look into it, right? I'd say it maybe doesn't exactly qualify because I just heard so much praise for it by that point, but kind of a similar boat. And if I'm looking through here, like, um, the only other game I tend to be like this with, and I, I haven't, I haven't let myself indulge on this kind of thing in a while. You know, it's kind of like, for me, it's like my trip to the casino or my crack cocaine. Like, I, I, I quit it and I'm good. But once in a while, like once or twice a year, I kind of, kind of let myself go back in. But idle clicker games, things like Adventure Capitalist. Or I don't, you know, clicker heroes, right? These games where all you do is just watch the number go up, you spend the number, you reinvest the number, and you go back in. Those are ones where I will just dump, just jump in. I'll just be like, I need the dopamine. My brain needs to feel these specific unhealthy things. I need to lose track of myself for a bit. Like I gotta just ethereally escape and lose my brain. <laughs> Uh, it's very unhealthy. That's why I don't really do them. But those are ones that fit that bill. That's probably not the answer you would have expected on any front, but hopefully it's a good answer. And Star Caliburn, with the last question here, asks, I don't know if this was asked already, but what made you get into video creation? For me, it's a very winding path that in retrospect makes a lot of sense considering what I know now about how I operate. But basically... Back in the late 2000s, um, voice dub over was a cool thing, right? We're doing a dub. Um, it's kind of back in vogue a bit with the, um, oh, what's the name of that group? The Sonic the Hedgehog fan dubs, you know what I mean? It's kind of back in vogue. Like, that's the most late 2000s thing on YouTube I've seen in my circles in a while. And it's kind of incredible. Because it really just did feel like a lost start of, me and my friends are going to dub over this thing and be stupid. <laughs> but... Yeah, you know, a lot of people like that. It, it kind of came back, and it, that's kind of cool. Like, that felt like a part of the old internet that just wouldn't return nowadays, right? Um, it's the kind of thing that eventually evolved into stuff like a bridged series. 
and things of that nature. So to see it kind of go back to that is kind of interesting. But what I do, I I'd take my Nikon Coolpix camera, I'd set it up, I'd um, I'd start like the Sonic Heroes opening cutscene, and I'd voice over it with my very awesome Sonic Tails and Knuckles impressions, doing incredibly witty and funny jokes. I'm sure. I must have been like what 14, 15 at this time. I still remember my parents going out to like. 7-Eleven for some reason and I was like, oh yeah, I got the house to myself. I got to set up the camera So I'd put them up on YouTube. My cousin would comment on the videos amazing times and The thing is, you know, I, I think like a lot of people you just Find stuff you like on YouTube and you kind of want to emulate it, you know, and you're like, that's cool I, I like watching that. I want to make something like that. I want to do what they're doing, you know whether it be just because you think it's neat or if it's like an ego thing, right? Like you want the attention they're getting or something because like, hey, if you're doing stuff like this and putting it out there, you want attention, right? It's not bad to say you want attention, but um, <laughs> yeah, it was that for me. Ironically, it did evolve um, to a bridging. I was interested in the bridging. I did a first episode Pokemon a bridge thing that I think is thankfully lost to the internet. That one is just gone. It was bad. But, you know, I just grab an anime episode off of YouTube of the Pokemon thing, cut it down, make very funny, very original, very awesome jokes over it. And, um, yeah, it, it evolved to a bridging. I went to YouTube eventually, um, December 2009 is when I made the Meekness fan account. And I did a Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds abridged, which um, I'm looking at it here. It's gone on YouTube, but I can still see the analytics. It had 54,891 views. I put it up January 30th, 2011. And I just did all the voices. You know, I don't think I wrote for it. I think it was literally just off the cuff. And yeah, so if you liked Yu-Gi-Oh! abridged stuff back then, um, you may have seen me doing that because <laughs> I didn't realize this had 55,000 views until just now. Um, man, yeah. And it just evolved from there, right? Like I liked brain scratch commentaries. So I'd watch those guys and then I, I didn't watch FTCR. So it's funny then that I guess that I wound up um, joining FTCR just by complete sheer happenstance. Like I, I met Gareth and Steven, um, at the St. Louis Sonic Boom in 2013. And if I was not there, I would never have ever been a part of FTCR. Like literally, I went there and met those guys and had dinner just fucking randomly. Gareth and I had like lightly talked before that, but we didn't really know who each other were. So we went from there. I started doing um, let's play kind of stuff over there, which led to me kind of eventually being like, okay, why well, I like to do something on my own and I like to script it. I feel better scripted, you know, and I'd watch stuff like Johnny, you know, some call me Johnny and videos like that. And I'd always watch like game review stuff on YouTube. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to gosh, I don't know anything about play PlayStation. You know, I did like a duck hunt review and a little Inferno. I was just making myself play games. And eventually I was like, I'm going to fill in the gaps in my PlayStation history because I have a job now and I keep buying all these games and I'm not playing them. So I'm going to make myself play them, blah, blah, blah. So that went on to make warning to love playstation which is why uh that existed and then i was like oh this is fun because to get into why i enjoy like this specifically now it's like um when i can get myself to make a video the thing i like about it is that it's kind of like putting together a puzzle and the frustrating part for me is that it's a puzzle where you have to make the pieces yourself and sometimes I can't always make those pieces. <laughs> um, hence where I'm at now with the Mykonos fan channel currently, but when you can make the pieces, it is so fulfilling to me to make it come together. I enjoy putting the audio track down. I enjoy putting the video track down. I enjoy um, getting to make real this like vague um, hazy ideation of a video I have in my head and seeing it come to life in front of me. And I just like watching it develop over the start to end process, right? 
It's why um, I really like when Kevin sends me something to edit. Because the pieces are already there. I don't have to sit down and write it. I don't have to sit down and voice it. I don't have to listen back to the voiceover to make sure if it's good or not. I just get what he gives me and I can make the puzzle, you know? And he's very generously um, um, descriptive and such with his notes and timestamps so that I can pretty much see exactly what he wants the video to be for as much as I can provide to it. And uh, yeah, I, I can assemble that puzzle and it's very fulfilling to me. It just feels good, you know? It, it's kind of the sensation I get. is. It hit me earlier today that the way to put it is like, it is like solving a puzzle. Uh, yeah, and that's one thing I like. Obviously, it's the other side is that it's really cool to play a game and um, state my opinion on it and put it out there. See if people agree, disagree, push back on things, hopefully politely. Sometimes people are just really mean for no reason, which is the, the part I probably dislike the most about YouTube. <laughs> Because people will just treat you like a punching bag for no reason, but you know. I try to be good to everybody at first blush. Why can't everybody do the same? But yeah, I don't know. It's just it's just cool to me. Like the whole the fact the the other part. I, I'm working through this in real time. Sorry. The the other thing I like about it is like I, I remember a little creepo years ago described the internet this way and it, and it really clicked with me he's like you know i have my real life but the internet is like a fun circus i can escape to right it's like a little getaway it's like a little circus i can go there and just to have fun whenever i want and i can leave the circus whenever i want kind of deal and that resonated with me because i was like it is kind of like a circus on there like it is fun it feels like a bizarro world sometimes right like you can go to youtube you can put yourself out there and you can potentially make a living just off of being you and talking about video games you play, which is crazy. That's bizarre. That's insane. Like we just watched G4 crumble again for being like a gaming TV channel kind of thing, right? A lot of reasons why, whatever, but it's just insane that that can be a thing. Like that can be the life you lead. And it's very fascinating to me and everything about internet culture and the culture of um, doing this stuff on YouTube is also just immensely interesting to me. So participating in it in even the slight ways I do is um, quite interesting to me also. So that's kind of like the other half of it, right? There's like the personal fulfillment of making a video from start to finish and seeing an end product and going like, wow, yeah, I made that. Cool. Um, and there's also just the part that's the culture, right? Like um, there's a lot of different people making a lot of different things. Um, someone's always making something cool and interesting, right? Like there's always something new to look forward to from someone. And I think that's really neat. So, um, yeah, that's how I got into video creation. And that's what kept me in it. Basically, it'd be cool to be on the internet doing cool things in some fashion forever. We'll see how that goes, but yeah. That's the long, that's kind of how I got here. I think that answers the question and hopefully answers some other questions you didn't know you had. Uh, yes, I used to be an abridger. Imagine if I was still an abridger. I'd do all my silly little voices and I'd, I, I'd improv and I'd, I'd get them taken down by the Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds copyright holders. <laughs> Hold on, let's see. Does it tell me? See details. Uh... It's been so long, it doesn't even tell me who submitted the claim, but it was like an actual... They were in their rights. It was Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's footage, right? I wasn't going to be like, oh, it's fair use. I was afraid of getting my ass sued, but the copyright strike expired. Anyway, we're at half an hour. Thank you for listening. Thank you for asking questions. If you'd like to submit one, comment below or go to the Question Seeking Answers channel on my Discord. Ask me some stuff. Make me talk. I was in a real talkative mood tonight. <laughs> I hope it shows. All right, everybody. Um, yeah, I'll see you around. Take care. Enjoy your gaming. And um, E3 month's coming up. Yeah, look at that. So hopefully there's some good stuff there. Subscribe to the Crubcast. Check out FTCR. I'm Ekinus Fan. A Double Scar Caliber and Goldstorm07. Go, go say hi to them. All right. Bye, everybody. Whoa.